Hello, my friend. Hope you're doing well. Mike Shreve here. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. It is going to be a very, very important listen. A lot of the people that come to us are looking for help in scaling their business, right? Whether they're trying to get a better lead acquisition system, we help them with acquisition funnels, do book funnels, uh, whether they're trying to get a sales team built or whether they're trying to, you know, create a team around themselves. There's so many different ways and approaches that you can take to scale a business and we help people with all of those. But when we say scale, what do we actually mean? Well, of course, there's all the benefits we want, right? We want the bigger income. We want the more freedom. We want to have a a company that's more valuable. If we ever want to sell it down the road, there's all these sorts of things that we want from scale. But what does it actually mean? It doesn't mean the benefits. It means an action. Scaling is a verb. What it really means is accelerating the effects of the offers or offer that you have in your business. Everything you sell, product, service, coaching, whatever it is, creates a cause and effect, right? What you are selling determines who you're working with. It determines your day-to-day because of how much you might be involved in the thing or not involved in the thing, how much stress it causes you, how much stress it doesn't cause you. So there are effects when selling the thing that you sell. And when you are scaling or growing, whether it's rapidly or slowly over time, What that actually means, what that verb actually means is that you are simply accelerating the effects of your offer as it stands today into essentially your life. You will experience more of what your offer provides you now. Now, for some of you, that's a great thing because your offer is really dialed in and it's giving you everything that you want. For most people, I've been doing this for 15 years, I would say more than 85 to 90% of the people that I talk to who are thinking that they are now at the stage of their business where they're going to scale. If they were to experience more of what their offer provided them or the effects of their offer, if they were to experience that accelerated starting tomorrow, and this is, this is not hyperbole and I'm not over-exaggerating, many of them would be in burnout mode in six months or less because the offers that they have right now They would not be able to, from a personal standpoint, withstand or suffer through or be able to live with more of what their offer gives them. Yeah, sure, they might make more money, but y'all know that doesn't last very long when you have to wake up and live with the reality of the effects of your offer. So what I want to do, and and look, I'm not exaggerating. I don't have any hidden agenda here when I say 85 to 90 percent of the people that I talk to, when I look at their offers, when when we first meet or when we're first working together, if they were to experience that offer accelerated, it would lead to really negative effects in their personal life. Increased stress, less time, etc. All those things we want to avoid. So a lot of people might say, well, then the advice is don't scale, right? Don't bring more of that into your life. I think of it a little bit differently. I say scale, but let's address the problems of the offer first. That's why a lot of people, they come to us, say, I want to write a book, I'm ready to write a book. And the first thing I ask is, well, what offer are you writing the book for? It makes no sense to go through this entire process of writing a book, doing a low ticket funnel, building a team, doing all of this stuff that is simply an accelerant to an offer or offers that exist in your business. That if you were to accelerate those offers, you would be in big trouble in a couple months, right? It makes no sense to go through that offer. So we always check first, what is the offer that you're writing this book for? Is it one you actually want to or should or even can accelerate to the level that you want to accelerate to? So today, in today's episode, we're going to talk about some of the specific signs that you probably need to spend some more time working on your offer before you get too excited about scaling. And by the way, for those of you who may be interested in help to make sure that you can fix your offer faster so you can get to scaling faster, we do help people with offer creation and, and getting rid of the negative effects of bad offers or poorly designed offers because it's, it's fundamental. You can't do anything else in business until your offer is properly squared away. Okay, so number one, the number one sign is that you are the only one selling or marketing it. One of the signs that your offer is failing you, one of the signs that your offer is not ready to start scaling is that you are the only one marketing or selling it. Let me run you through an example of how this shows up, right? One of the ways you can recognize the symptom. If you have ever hired someone else to say, market your business, let's say you've hired um, a Facebook ads manager or something, or you've hired a copywriter or something, and you plug that person into your business 
and they are unable to generate results for you. And we're assuming they have basic competency levels, then that is a sign that your offer is either tied too closely to you as a person, which by definition is unscalable. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Or number two, and this is often, this is more often the case. Uh, sometimes people can misidentify. They think it's because people will only buy from them, but actually what's happening is that your offer is too difficult to sell. It's too confusing. It's too convoluted. It's too the same as everybody else. There's no unique selling position. There's nothing for someone to come into your business and hang on to, to do their job well enough for you to be happy with the results. You, your offer is not good enough for someone to come off the street, right? Come from outside of your company, come into your company, sell it on your behalf, and you have enough profit and et cetera left over for you to be happy. Now, this is a problem if you want to scale because there is no version of scaling a business where you aren't bringing in help to sell and market your offers. That does not exist. Now, what does that mean by definition? It means we have to have offers that are compelling enough, that are interesting enough, that are good enough, that someone who isn't necessarily a master or isn't necessarily as intimate as us with the offer can still go and sell it. Why? Because if the only way that someone else can sell your offer is if they are the best marketer in the world or the best salesperson in the world, or they spend a year and a half studying all of your material. And I have really bad news for you. Those people are too expensive and too busy for you to be able to afford them. And this is a hurdle to scale. If you can only grow your business by hiring the best in the world, you are going to pay an insane premium to get your business functioning at a basic level. And a basic level would be other people able to sell and market your business. I have a team of salespeople. I have a marketing team. Our offers are sellable and marketable by people who can come in who don't have to be the best in the world, which means what? Which means we can afford them, which means we have margin, which means that they can get up to speed rather quickly. For example, we have a great sales team. It doesn't take years for them to get good at selling our stuff. They can get sales in the first week or two of them working on our team, and then they can improve over weeks and months, and then they're cranking really good conversion numbers. That is not a result of us being great at hiring, that is a result of we have an offer that other people can sell. Now, you take that core concept and then you get good at hiring and then you bring in good sales team leadership like we have and then you hire really good salespeople like we do have. Then you're simply multiplying the multiplier. But at a core fundamental level, if you can't hire decently competent salespeople, decently competent marketing people to sell your offer on your behalf, you don't have a good offer. The offer is now the hurdle in your business. Because as I've said before, there is no version of scale where other people aren't helping you in the marketing and sales department. It just doesn't exist. Eventually, you're going to have to hire for that. And that brings me to point number two. So another sign or symptom that your offer is the reason that you're having a hard time scaling or that it's failing you is that you can't afford to hire for fulfillment or you can't afford to spend money on traffic. You can't afford to spend money on marketing because of the offer that's in your business. You're unable to have the cash resource to be able to hire who and when and where and all the different ways you can hire and who you're hiring and how you're building it in. Now, this is important. Again, there's no version of scale where you aren't getting help. So if your goal is scale, if your goal is working yourself out of your business, if your goal is to become an owner rather than, you know, or to become a business owner rather than just an owner of a job, if you really want that and that's your goal, you're going to have to get help. And the way that you afford help isn't by playing the volume game. This is a big mistake that people make. They think, if only I can sell 5,000 of these every month. 
And then they have the offer that they had before. And now they're dealing with 5,000 units a month of this offer that was already causing them problems and et cetera, et cetera. Instead, what you do is you really start to bring things down to per unit cost. You really think, start thinking about margins. You start thinking about designing an offer that is worth charging more. Right? So we're talking about offer design now. How do we charge more? We create something that is worth more. And we create something that is worth so much that when we sell it for a lot of money, it still seems like a discount because it truly is, right? A very simple example of this is if you can sell a $10,000 outcome for $2,000, that's, that's a discount, right? That would be an example. So when we're really thinking and looking at, you know, our, at the end of the month, we get our P&L and we're like, oh, I'm tired, I really need some help. And we say to ourselves, but I can't afford anyone right now. It's, it's very easy to think that the reason we can't afford someone right now is because maybe we don't know the financial ninja tricks of the best CFO in the world. It might be because we think our business needs to be bigger in volume before we start hiring. We think maybe, oh, if I could just find a cheaper marketing method, I'll be able to finally afford hiring. But the reality is, is that it comes back to the offer. Because what you're saying when you see that P&L and your brain starts to go searching for other situations, is that the offer or offers in your business right now are not giving you the margin you need to build a support team, a support system around taking that offer out into the market. And that includes your sales, your marketing, your fulfillment, your HR, your finance, all of those other pieces. And so if you find yourself wanting to hire or you find yourself hiring people and then when they do their thing, there's not enough money left over at the end of the month uh, and they're competent and you like them, but you're like, oh, I can't hold on to them because I can't afford it. You have offer problems. You're not charging enough for your offer or it could also be that your offer isn't compelling enough. So one of the reasons it's so expensive to sell your offer is because people just aren't that interested in buying it. So it's like a more Herculean effort. It's a bigger rock to push. It requires more effort to get that thing sold in the market. So it becomes more expensive. You have to hire more, you know, either, again, like I said before, you either have to hire the best in the world or it takes, you know, moderately competent individuals longer to sell, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so again, this, this problem, which seems like it's other things, right? It seems like it's a financial strategy problem. It seems like it's, you know, I just need to find a better marketing strategy. It's actually your offer. If you had a better offer, if you started from the ground floor and built something that was inexpensive to sell because it was so compelling, that it had the margins because you purposely designed it to have bigger, better outcomes than your competitors and what people are used to buying, than what people even they themselves expect when they go into the buying process, then you can afford what you need to afford, who you need to afford rather easily. Right? It's not a big deal to be able to afford those people. I and mean, that all comes down to the offer that you've created, the promises, the USP, the value that's there. I can't tell you how many times in my career someone comes to me and says, you know, I really want to do this new marketing method because I heard it's the cheapest. And I take a look at what they're doing and I find that their current marketing method is fine. It's a great marketing method. It's getting them leads, getting them interested people. But the problem is they're not charging enough. And the reason they're not charging enough is because they can't charge enough. It's not about just tacking on bigger numbers. Sometimes it is. Sometimes people are just afraid of asking what they're actually worth. And so just encouraging them to you know, properly get paid for what they're actually doing. But more often than not, it's because their offer really actually isn't worth more. And so doing the work of creating something that is worth more fixes, quote unquote, their marketing problem. All of a sudden, the funnel they had before, quote unquote, works. Because what do we mean when we say work? We mean when you put traffic into it, when you pay for traffic, when you pay for exposure, there's a return on that exposure. And then the, the more positive the return, the more we say, hey, this method works really, really well. So this is something you have to think about if you're starting to scale. If you don't know how to make your offer more compelling, that's where you need to start. That's where you need to get help. We can help you, obviously. You can also ask people, uh, ask your buyers, what, what would they have done to improve the offer if they were to buy it again? And I mean, there's, there's a, 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 we could have a 30 day daily sequence of podcasts just talking about how to improve offers. Okay. And I am, by the way, working on a book, a little shameless plug on how to improve offers. It's work we do every single day. We train our own team members on how to increase uh, offers and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so number three, sign number three, is that you are struggling to find a consistent marketing method to scale it. Now, this is really a derivative of the first two. Remember, the first one is that you're the only one selling it. 
are marketing it. And the second one is that you can't afford to hire other people to sell and market it or to fulfill on it or anything like that. But number three is, is a little bit more specific. So you struggle to find a consistent marketing method to scale it. There's, there's two issues with this. One is, you know, there's a lot of talk in the entrepreneurial community about shiny object syndrome. And sometimes there's shame around it. It's like, hey, you, you have shiny object syndrome. Stop bouncing from thing to thing. You just need to sit down and focus and, you know, get yourself together and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, in my experience, a lot of people have this shiny object experience where they're jumping from thing to thing because they're looking for a solution and the things aren't working that they're trying, right? I mean, that's not, that's not a diagnosis. That's not a disorder. That's not a negative. That's, that's good entrepreneurship. If something isn't working, you jump from the next thing. You, you, you abandon what doesn't work and you absorb what does. But the problem, the problem is that very often I'm seeing people jump from method to method to method to method. I'm seeing them making these adjustments in the wrong areas, right? And what I often see is that they're adjusting their marketing methods, not realizing that the thing that's broken is the offer. That it is hard to find a marketing method that works for a bad offer. For a good offer, almost anything works. That's why I tell people all the time, look, here's what I love to do. I love to do low ticket acquisitions. I like books. I like building lists of customers, sending those customers nurture content, getting those customers on phone calls, selling them awesome stuff on the back end. That's what I like to do. It is not the only way to grow a business. And if you have a good offer, every method will work. Some may be more expensive. Some may take longer. Some, you know, everything has a pro and con. Everything has benefits. Everything has drawbacks. Some things and some methods are easier and faster to scale. It's why I like acquisition funnels myself, but they all should work. Now, what does that mean? How does that actually translate into your day-to-day -day living? It means that if you really did have a really good offer, you wouldn't have shiny object syndrome because you would try something and it would work. So this idea of struggling to find a marketing method that works for you, it might actually just be a symptom of an offer that is not serving you as the business owner. Because be honest with yourself, is shiny object syndrome fun? No, it's not. Do you, are you better off in life jumping from thing to thing? I've never seen it be a positive benefit to someone. I've seen it cause stress and frustration and you start to get into the valley of despair and you start thinking maybe this isn't going to work and what's wrong and da -da. maybe marketing doesn't work. Maybe all these gurus are lying. Nobody actually makes money and you start going down that path when in reality, the thing you're trying to sell is what's actually sabotaging you. You can only sell or market your thing as good as the thing is, right? Quick example. I can sell you an apple. I can sell you a garage full of gold bars. The best I can do with the apple is what the apple gives me. The best I can do with a garage full of gold bars is what the gold bars give me. Meaning inherent in the offer itself is the promise. This apple will make you healthy and it's super delicious. This garage full of gold bars will make you so rich. You can do whatever you want and retire for the rest of your life. Inherent in the offer, inherent in the thing I'm trying to sell, the thing I'm trying to give to you, the thing I'm trying to do for you, is the promise. And your marketing and selling can only be as good as. It can never be better, otherwise you're getting into overhype and lying, right? So if you're an honest marketer, if you're an honest business owner, the best you can do is what the offer itself allows you to do. So if you're jumping from marketing method to marketing method to marketing method, be, and you're trying to be honest, you're trying to maintain integrity, it might just be that you're trying to sell an apple in a market that is used to being sold, you know, garages full of gold bars, whatever that might translate to for you. And by the way, no disrespect to apples, I love them. But, you know, if I had a choice, I too would take a garage full of gold bars over an apple for a whole number of reasons. Garage full of gold bars are more rare than apples. I don't have to buy this specific apple. I can just go to the grocery store and get my own, probably for the same price you're trying to, et cetera, et cetera. We could have a whole masterclass on apples versus garages and gold bars. But the point is, not to make this too repetitive, but it's worth really drilling into your mind, is that if you're struggling to find a method to sell and market your business that's consistent, that you can maintain, 
that you can set up once and you know that's the thing you do for at least a few years not a, not a few days not a few weeks not this jumping from thing to thing that the internet marketing is so famous for but a consistent sustainable long-term thing it might be because the offer itself just isn't that good and another element to this which is you struggle to find a consistent marketing method to scale it also comes back to the design of your offer as it relates to your lifestyle requirements so there's a lot of people who accidentally blame lack of scalability on the marketing method, right? When in reality, what's happening is they are selling their offer, but having to fulfill on the offer is really making things difficult for themselves. So whether they are overextended and trying to fulfill on it, or whether we come into now number four, you just don't like your customers. So the things that you're doing are attracting the wrong people. Maybe the people that are coming into your offers are are drama queens and kings. Maybe the people that are coming into your offers don't have what you need in order for you to be able to do your best work. Maybe they're further behind than you would want them to be and etc. So this is connected to that ability or more specifically the consistent struggle to maintain consistency. And so we'll end here on number four which is the fourth sign or symptom that your offer is failing you is that you don't like your customers. You don't like the clients that are coming into your world. And it's like we already said, what you are able to attract is limited by the basic promise of what your offer is. I'll give you a really good example. And it's so, you know, when you really sit and think about it, it, it can be a light bulb moment for you, but it's one of those, it's, it's a perfect example of how throwaway we can be sometimes as business owners, just making rash assumptions about offers moving too quickly to other things like, well, what's my marketing technique? Or what's the tech tech stack I'm going to use? Or what's the, you know, what's the secret ninja hack for blah, blah, blah. If I make an offer that is built to help struggling small business owners, it's a phrase I see all the time in y'all's offers out there. You go to the market, you say, I help struggling small business owners to, let's say, get enough leads to fill their pipeline. Well, what do we know about the kind of person who is going to be excited about that offer? We know that they're going to be, what, struggling. And what do we mean by struggling? Probably don't have any money. How can we confirm that assumption? Because we said what we're going to do is help them get leads to fill their pipeline, which means by definition, what? They probably don't have a full pipeline and they're not consistently getting leads. What happens in a business that doesn't consistently get leads? that doesn't have a full pipeline, what do they not have a lot of? Sales, right? What happens if you don't have a lot of sales? You don't have a lot of money. And so we go out into the world, we've built this thing that's for the struggling small business owner who wants leads to fill a pipeline. And then we are surprised when we are on the phone with people who don't have money. Or we're taking money from people we do not like working with. We don't want to work with somebody who's still struggling to figure out how to sell something, right? Now, maybe you are the person who loves that. That's, the point isn't that these types of people are a certain way or not a certain way. The point is that if your goal is to work with a certain type of person, you have to build an offer that that certain type of person wants. And look, in all, you know, from brother to brother and brother to sister and fellow business owner, and I say this with love, most of you are running offers for people you would not want to spend an afternoon with. And you are getting into financial obligations with people who you have to spend weeks with, months with. And that is a sign that your offer is creating unnecessarily a hurdle to scale. Because remember, the very beginning of this, what do we say? Scale is simply accelerating the effects that the offer is currently giving you. In other words, you will get more of the same. You will experience more of working with these customers or clients that you don't want to work with. And let's be honest, in six months, you'll be burned out if you can make it six months. That is a hurdle to scale. That will keep you from scaling because you're a human being and you will want to not do that to yourself. And so you will self-sabotage. You will turn things off that were working and you won't even necessarily know why. It'll just be kind of like on the edges of your, uh, your sort of awareness. You're like, I don't know, there's just something wrong with the business. I don't like it. I'm turning it off and et cetera and et cetera. Another example for the health and fitness space I see a lot. People say, I will help people who are really overweight lose 20, 30 pounds very quickly. 
And then they are surprised when the people who are showing up to phone calls have really bad lifestyle habits. And they are thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, to get this person to lose 20 to 30 pounds, I'm going to have to restructure their entire life. We have to go back to the basics. I'm going to have to teach them how to drink water because they're not even drinking water. i got to teach them how to eat their vegetables. Like this is not, it's because the offer you created was for that person. If you want to work with elite athletes, then you need to create an offer that is for elite athletes. And that includes being able to deliver the outcome that elite athletes want to deliver. You have to purposefully and specifically design it because everything else in your business is simply an extension of what your offer is. What you say in your marketing, what you say in sales, the financial realities you're going to live, what it will be like to live in your business, the day-to-day who you're working with, how they treat you, how you treat them, the work you're doing every day, all of that is simply an extension. It it doesn't matter if you're going to write a book, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to do acquisition funnels, none of that matters until you have the right offer. It's why in every single thing that we sell, step one is fixing your offer, right? So, you know, we're out there saying, hey, acquisition funnels are great, but step one is to make sure we don't build an acquisition funnel that accelerates an offer that you are burning out on in six months. There's, there's no point in doing that. No point whatsoever. Especially when the good news is it's quite easy to fix broken offers. It really is. I will tell you the easiness of fixing broken offers or fixing offers that are failing you comes from having someone else take a look. I'm a business owner. I'm an offer creator. I know what it can be like to be blinded by this sort of creativity paradox, which is to say, in order to create something, you have to be able to love it and own it and make it and, you know, do what is required to get it built. And that is a good thing to get something going. But eventually, external feedback will always beat out trying to look at something on your own because you have blind spots in your offer. I have blind spots in my offer. How do we know we have blind spots? Because if we had already seen the problem, it would have been fixed already. You and I, we're not dumb, right? We we, we work hard. We know we want success. We hear these words of make a really good offer and the offer will be able to, you know, all the things that we talked about. You'll have better marketing, better sales. You'll be able to hire people. It'll be margin. We want all of these things. So if we knew how to fix it, we already would have fixed it. And this is why When it comes to offer design, external feedback is critical. It is critical. It is not talked about in the world of internet marketing. I don't know why. It's such an easy thing. And like I said, this is why it's easy. Just getting the feedback is an easy thing to do. It doesn't require, you know, a lot of complexity. Uh, You know, as a matter of fact, if you want my personal feedback on your offer, We have options available at Peaceful Profits for you to be able to do that. We have options to get feedback from my team. You know, it's it's as easy as saying yes, you know, and and hiring us to do that. That's how easy it is. It's not, you have to go build different things to figure out. Don't overcomplicate the process of feedback. That's another thing that a lot of people do is they just overcomplicate. You don't need that. You just need someone else to be able to look at your offer, help you see the blind spots, ask you what is it that you really want? What are you really trying to do? help you to consider whether the offer or offers you have in your business are actually built to deliver the thing that you want, right? There's a lot of people running companies right now on offers that will never give them what they want. They are not designed to do so. And they're struggling and they're working long hours and they, they're hanging on to this hope that someday something will click, but fundamentally the engine that's driving their company was never built to go the speed they're trying to go or the distance they're trying to go, or the direction they're trying to go. So, like I said, this is a, this is a longer episode. This is a very important episode. If, you know, when I die, I want them to write on my tombstone, check your offer, you know, make sure your offer is giving you what you want. Most of the problems in my personal business life, right? So most of the struggle, sources of frustration, sources of anxiety for the past 15 years have come from me building an offer, thinking it's going to give me one thing and it giving me something else. So I'm not speaking to you from some ivory tower. I'm speaking to you as a fellow business owner, a fellow traveler on this journey, if you want to call it that, having made these mistakes, okay? Having scaled the wrong offer, 
And I think, you know, I never want to make a podcast that scares anyone. That's not really my intention. I don't, I don't like using fear in that way. But if I can scare you just a little bit, you do not understand right now. I know you don't. I know you do not understand right now how bad it can get to scale the wrong offer. It can get, uh, it can get to a level of misery and a level of obligation that you then have to fulfill on when you're in that level of misery. It can dash your hopes. It can suck the fun out of life. It can suck the life out of life to scale an offer that you should not have scaled because it was not built to do what you want it to do. So when I say this is an important episode, this extends beyond business. We're talking about making sure that you're building something you actually want to build. I've never met a business owner who could not improve their offer. Anyone who says my offer is fine, that is one of the biggest signs that their offer isn't. If you truly understood what the effects can be of a scaled offer, you would be constantly in the back of your mind looking for ways to improve your offer. You would always be saying to yourself, how can I make this better? How can I shape this to be more like the offer I want to design on purpose to give me the outcomes I'm trying to get from this business? I get very, very nervous for people when they think their offer is fine as it is right now. It is an ongoing organic process. It takes time. It takes experience. It takes making mistakes. It takes accepting feedback. It takes all of these things. And it's really a mindset to always be asking, how can I make my offer better? One of the things we didn't even talk about on this episode is the fact that your competition is very likely improving their offers. Right? And so there's that, that whole dynamic. There's the issue of if you're in the help industry and you're helping people to get outcomes, outcomes expand, outcomes, desired outcomes change. Um, the methods by which outcomes are delivered change. So this is, a, this is a lifelong organic mindset. It's a process. It's something that you do. I hope for your sake you never settle into this, well, my offer is fine as it is. Now, does it mean that we need to change our offer every two weeks? No, because then you have a business that changes every two weeks, and that's a very difficult business to run. It's an impossible business to hire for because people are constantly changing every, you know, changing what they do every two weeks. But it does mean that as much as you're thinking about marketing, as much as you're thinking about sales, as much as you're thinking about the financial side, you have to be at least thinking that much about your offers, if not twice as much thinking about your offers. That would be the correct balance for a business owner in terms of where their attention should be. Most people that I know aren't there. They build the offer, they set it up, they forget about it, they move on. Okay, so just some things to think about. Again, I don't want to get too rambly here. Let's go ahead and close today's episode. If you would like some help on your offer, something that we are very passionate about here at Peaceful Profits, the peaceful in Peaceful Profits comes from the offer. If you would like us to help you to create a more peaceful offer for you, a more profitable offer, an offer you can start hiring and building a team around so you can start working yourself out of the day-to-day, an offer that sustains itself, that fulfills itself, that can give you bigger and better outcomes than you could deliver on your own. If you're looking for any of these things, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Peacefulprofits.com forward slash call. Again, that is peacefulprofits.com forward slash call. Book a call with our team. We're no pressure. We don't have to be. We've got plenty of demand. Talk to our people. Again, We have people because we have offers that are good enough to have people, right? We have a great sales team. We have a great team of advisors, people who can help you to make the right decision from a variety of offers that we have that are good offers that will make sense to you if they are the right fit for you because they were designed to do so, to deliver the outcomes that you actually want and need um, at prices that are affordable for what they offer and et cetera, et cetera. The value's there for you to basically get value at a discount. All of those things are at play. Please book a call with us peacefulprofits.com forward slash call. Talk to our team and see if we can help you. You very likely need it, okay? And that's not a dig on you. Every business owner needs it, okay? Every business owner needs help with their offer. It doesn't mean that you have failed in any way. It doesn't mean that you are bad in any way. It means that there's just been a culture of, I don't know if it's an internet marketing problem or a general entrepreneurship problem. There's been a culture where we overemphasize marketing, sales, team, and we underemphasize the thing that determines whether or not we can even do any of those things, which is our offer. What I'd like to do is try and turn the tide on that, 
get more business owners the help they need with their offers so that those other things, sales, marketing, team, etc., can be a natural extension of an offer that gives them what they actually want out of their business. So again, it's peacefulprofits.com forward slash call. I do hope you book a call with us soon. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Very, very important. Thank you for letting me get this message out to you and we will talk to you later.